can actually. All right. Well, welcome everyone. So welcome back to class. So we are continuing our book discussion of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. And, you know, when I chose this volume, the reason I did was because I so felt like King it Arthur did a good and job his Knights of the Round Table. And, you know, when I chose this volume, volume, the reason I did was because I felt like King so Arthur did a good job with Knights of the Round Table. And, you know, I don't when I chose this volume, the reason I Right on time. Okay. <laughs> we can't figure out where that's coming from. Sorry, I'm pausing because we don't know what's going on. We can't figure out where that's coming from. Sorry, I'm pausing because we don't know what's going on. Michael, can you can you mute for a second? Okay. That's it. It's Michael. Oh, it's Michael. What was he doing? Do you have, do you have headphones, Michael? Huh. Okay, there he is now. Okay. Chris. Okay. That's it. No. Oh, it's Michael. It did it again. Michael is okay. The stream live, is what he's doing. Michael, is it possible that you're watching the stream live because the echo's coming through your thing? Okay. So let's. Um, sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> okay. So if you just um, mute it on the live one, it should be. You should be able to still listen. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'd normally mute the tab. Okay. okay there we go. All right. I was like, Oops. where is that coming from? <laughs> All right. No. No worries. Sorry, I'm kind of late. Uh, hey, Mark. Nice to see you. Um. All right. So. I, when I originally picked this volume, the reason I did was because I felt like it was doing, it did a pretty good job of being uh, comprehensive without being overwhelming and that it gave you a good through line of the stories. And now that we're three quarters of the way through, I feel like that really is the case. So I'm, I'm happy, especially with its treatment of the quest of the Holy Grail. So I'm curious about what you guys think as well. So hi to mark and good morning to bernadette right joining us from australia where she lives i think i think if i remember right in melbourne which is on like lockdown 5.0 right now so sorry about that um so if you understand nothing else about arthurian legend the quest for the holy grail is the one thing and this is our grail for tonight here's our holy grail uh, the quest for the Holy Grail is the one thing you must know a little bit about if you are ever going to understand Monty Python movies. Um, mm -hmm. But no, it's more than Monty Python, right? <laughs> Search for the Holy Grail, it, it comes up in almost everything. And in fact, you will hear like it's the Holy Grail in allusion in so many stories. So like something that is, hey, Simon Edits, um, something that is a Holy Grail is like something that is the ultimate thing that you would want. It is elusive, um, you know, difficult to come by. Very few people could get it. And so it's very important to understand what people mean when they say that something is a holy grail. And so I think that's that's one of the things. Um, so the thing that strikes me about these chapters in this section of the book is that the tone is so sad. Like they are on this great quest, the greatest quest possible. And yet there's this silent understanding that it's all about to come crashing down, right? Um, and in this section, we get bookend chapters about how the grail arrives at Camelot and how the quest ends. And then in between, we have five chapters about different adventures of some of the Knights of the Round Table. So this book has seven chapters, those two bookended chapters, and then the um, and then the individual stories. So we'll launch in and I actually I actually found this section really obnoxious. I don't know why. <laughs> okay, well it's always I good. Feel like to it was way too short for one. You thought it was too short. Yeah. Did you would you want each of the stories to have been longer, or would you have wanted more of the quest? I don't know. I, I probably would want, I mean, in an ideal world, all stories to be longer, but yeah. Okay, as we go through the stories, um, discussing them, Michael, I'd really like to hear your opinion on which story, like if we get to a story like, this one could have definitely been more developed. Like, I'd like to hear that. Um, and Siren underscore edits or Jay Sand or Tessa, 
whoever you want to be, you are welcome. So um, our first chapter in this book section, How the Grail Came to Camelot, it's the Feast of Pentecost, of course, because mm -hmm. everything happens. Nothing um, interesting ever happens any other time. Like I said, Pentecost is the party <laughs> feast. That's when Pentecost all the crazy is stuff the party happens. Feast. So um, Mark makes an interesting point. He says, for a book with seven chapters, it was 75 pages. Seems like a low page per chapter ratio. And I think that's especially important when this book is actually fairly compact in size. So like it's it's not a standard like six by nine or something like that. The book itself is small. So that's a good point, Mark. Um, okay, so it's a Feast of Pentecost. Um, a beautiful lady comes riding in asking for Lancelot. He um, <laughs> takes him away. Which Spoiler is so alert, this happens like four times throughout this section alone. So, like, beautiful ladies asking for Lancelot. They can never sit down to dinner without some beautiful woman riding on a horse right into the middle of the dinner. Like, sir Knight, Sir Knight. Yes. Um, I need you. I need, need you. you for a I need the bravest oh. one. Okay. You're the bravest one, obviously. Um, <laughs> and, and then and I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if it was just like, um, like, I forgot my wallet at Walmart. And then the knights are like, oh no, <laughs> I'll go get it for you, Jamsel. <laughs> and they go in Kansas somehow. So, um, well, I guess that's not that much of a stretch if you live in Kansas, but they end up somewhere random in the world fighting dragons. So he takes him, so this lady leads him away. He meets his son Galahad and knights him. And Galahad, Galahad then comes and sits at um, the Siege Perilous. So we've been waiting the whole book to mm -hmm. see who is going to be the most pure knight. And um, I'm curious, my first question is, how do you think that Lancelot, what are some of the feelings you think that Lancelot has for Galahad? Maybe not necessarily just in this chapter, but in general. I mean, you've got the sort of weird disconnected father thing. I mean, do they have a normal father-son relationship? No. They have almost no father-son relationship in this book. <laughs> do we ever see a, any any paternal child interaction between them? It's kind of weird, actually. Would you want Lancelot as a father? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, we're all in agreement there. I think it's interesting because I think on the one hand, Doctor Mr. Sir Knight, it's Doctor Mister Sir Knight. <laughs> Mark, you crack me up. Um, so um, there's this funny moment when Sir Kay, like they're there at the Feast of Pentecost, and Sir Kay is like, "Gee, usually we have to see a strange adventure before we meet." Guess we're not gonna have a strange adventure this time. And then all of a sudden we find out, oh, by the way, there's another sword in another stone. And, and this was for a better night, even than Arthur. Yeah, well, before we were looking for the rightful king, and now we're looking for the best knight. So they were looking for something different. Um, in the context of this, in the context of this version of Arthur, what do you think? make someone what are qualities that make someone the best knight <laughs> we in this context it's tricky because normally most of the knights are different on different scales right like lancelot's the best fighter there's no question about that he's tied with gawain um but then in this pro situation it's problematic because galahad is both more noble and a better fighter <laughs> than Lancelot. And so you can't you can't use that to determine what they're measuring by this time. There is no measurement. They're all the best. They're all the best. And all the women are they're all amazing. <laughs> you have you have I Lancelot say... who is clearly stated to be the best knight multiple times, but again, he's this impure knight. So Right. Yeah. That um, Galahad who's that... like the ultimate, the perfect yeah, Christian perfect, knight. perfect, and then, but then he's not, because then there's Percival, who is also the best. Who is also the place. perfect. And then there's also, <laughs> and then it goes They're on. Bors. You know, um, you know what I found really weird? That we had all, all of this stuff with Sir Bors, when he barely features. 
Right. I thought that and was interesting. And they pointed out the fact that. that he hasn't had any quests, but mm. and that's one of the things that made him good. He didn't have any adventures or any glory, but he's been quietly being good the whole time. <laughs> I actually um, think I have a question about that later. Like, what is up with Sir Boris? Um, so um, Nazians shows up, or however you say his name. Jo Jonathan knows Latin, so he can correct me. Nazians. Nazians. Um, it'd, be, and, it'd be like a K. Okay, Nazians. Yeah, okay, Nazians. Nazians. Um, so Nazians shows up. He's a super important hermit slash. Hold on. So is Nazians um, the lady? Um, no, he's a guy. That's an I, I know, but is he the father of the guy Sir Percival fell in love with? The lady, whatever her name is. I don't remember her oh, name. It begins Blanche with a B Fleur. and it's really long. Blanche Fleur. Blanche Fleur, yeah. Is he um, her dad? Because I, I feel like he was the father I, of some important I, I I don't think I don't think so. I don't think so though. I think he's just like this one of the named hermits. Not all the hermits are named, but he's one of the named hermits. So he introduces this is why I feel like I needed the tree puppet to represent Nakians because I feel like he always yes. has a story. So he shows up and he and he's super and he introduces Galahad, but he doesn't tell the rest of the knights of the round table who Galahad is. He doesn't say, This is Galahad, by the way. This is Lancelot's son when he tricked mm -hmm. Elaine. I'm mean, like, you know what I mean? It's kind of crazy. And the Siege Perilous then has this new inscription. This is the siege of Sir Galahad, the High Prince. Did you guys notice that wording? Sir Galahad, yeah. the High Prince. What does that I thought that mean? was a bit weird because Lancelot's not royalty. No. So, I think. Oh, I guess I'd be from um, Blanche Fleur's side of the family then. Ooh, it could no, be wrong is the lane. Yes, yes, is she his grandfather royalty? is a king. His grandfather is a king. Okay. Strudel Kitty. I'm just I'm just sitting here going like this. I don't know what I'm doing. I was oh. gonna say it could be Galahad is the best knight, and one of the um criteria they have to be the best knight is to be the closest closest to God, so then close like the son of the Lord could also be another. Um, Prince reference. Let's ask the Magic Eight Ball. Why is Gal like is well the Magic Eight Ball can really only answer yes or only yes or no questions. Um, is Galahad <laughs> really the High Prince? It is certain. Uh, well, there well, we go. Inquiring minds want to know. Must be true. <laughs> um, Okay, so Jay Sand says, Sped read this part. It, it was actually longer than it seemed. Jonathan, did you have something you wanted to add? I mean, the only thing you can get out of that is that High Prince could be called, it's like Senior Prince, except it's not senior, it's not seniority based. So it, the question then would be, why is he Prince of Princes? Yeah, I mean, it brings up I an think, awkward question of who are all these other princes, because there's a lot of kings running around. Yeah, there are a lot of kings. Yeah. So like, oh, and they, none of the kings actually have any sons. Here's king and so and so and king and how many kings are there? And there are like, lots of lords and barons and dukes yeah, and whatnot. Yeah, we've got a, like a um, two Pretty kings serious aristocracy square, going on. square foot setup going on right now. I'm not sure how well that's working. Well, it's definitely like a feudal system of like. Yeah. You know, later we find out it's supposed to be like 450 AD. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this doesn't jive with the jousting. No, no. I mean, you cannot so joust. 450 AD, they did like not whatever. have great armor where you could joust <laughs> somebody trying to kill them, hit them dead on, and not kill them. <laughs> Jonathan, this yeah. is a good time for you to show the armor. Huh? I think this oh. is a good time to show the armor. Jonathan, yes. as one of his many talents, makes chainmail himself. Wow. That's awesome. The really good thing is there's an actual smell to it. There's so much iron exposed uh. to air. Yeah, we should put it on. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Wow. We have tested this before. It does, in fact, stop knives. Cool. <laughs> we tested, <laughs> we tested, we tested fairly responsibly. 
How heavy I, is it? I, I was about to say, please don't accidentally stab yourself. Like, <laughs> I must that, find the the strongest knife to break my um break my chainmail, and then you get stabbed, and you're like, that was a bad idea. It's it weighs probably about twelve pounds, but it doesn't wow. actually feel like that much when you're wearing. When you're wearing it, it feels a lot heavier when you're holding it. Wow. Can you show the aluminum one as well? Oh, yeah. I've done, I haven't done like a full shirt out of aluminum, but I've done segments. Okay. So there we go. Like Aluminum's a lot lighter. Yeah. That's so fun. Okay. Well, um, so this damsel on the white horse gives Lancelot this totally backhanded compliment that he is the best of sinful men. But his son is the best of all. Mm. And she tells him to weep for what he has lost. What has Lancelot lost? His purity. Okay. Yeah. He lost his purity. Um, lost the Siege Perilous, maybe? He, oh, he's made. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> nice. Good. Inquiring minds want to know an unanswered question. <laughs> had Lancelot not had the thing with Elaine and not fallen in love with Guinevere, would he have been the knight to sit in the Siege Perilous? Ooh, interesting, Michael. I love that. But then you've got all this destiny stuff going on, so probably yeah. not. So, but so I mean, like, if he if he didn't do that, then then the, that would mean that his fate was like it would he wouldn't have done that. Okay. So if his fate wasn't that he would fall in love with Guinevere, would he be worthy? I'm still worthy. Mm. Um, I'm still worthy, yeah. He also lost his, I wonder if he lost some of his pride because now he knows he can't be the best and he can't be the perfect mm. and goodliest knight. I love, I love the whole scene yeah. because I always read it as she comes in, she's like, you must be so sad. And he's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I supposed to be sad? And then no. she's like, you must mourn, mourn for what you have lost, for you are not the greatest of knights. You are only the greatest of sinful men. And he's like, okay. It's tricky because he's also got, I think Mark's right. Yeah, I don't I don't think that would have affected oh. the chair. Oh, Michael. Oh, Michael. Else but, if you're talking about what he lost, he did lose something pretty important when she's like, yeah, you're best of the sinful men because him being the best of the sinful men gets a lot of his friends killed. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I had to show but Michael. Being the because, best, he might okay. have not. On, um, on Michael's recommendation, I ordered a couple of these books. So uh, I have them now. So thank you for that recommendation. One, can you show um, the second one you, again? Yeah, you just reminded um, me of like this one is King Arthur and the Round mm -hmm. Table. And I thought that was one, a painting of Napoleon, and I was like, oh, that's a little suspicious. Yeah, Century wise, the, 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 the in the back of one of my books that looks kind of like Superman. Napoleon yeah, didn't invent a lot of Superman. Pose. I know, but it's like I thought it was that painting, and I was like, hold on. So King <laughs> Arthur realizes that this is a moment of crisis for Logris, and he says. This is the highest hour of this our holy realm. So if he knows it's going to lead to his downfall, why not just keep all the knights there? I mean, the, the round table has only been filled about five minutes. And See, I actually, I noticed this, and I was thinking maybe it's because Arthur realizes he can't cheat destiny, so he's not even going to try. Okay, okay. Although that might be a bit of a stretch considering how much he's tried in the past and how much other people have tried in the past. So it's interesting. I mean, what I think it would be tempting, right? I think it would be tempting. You realize I'm going to send these people out. He definitely recognizes that this is it. And I don't know if it's like this idea that we're never going to be able to hold a perfect moment for long. So like enjoy it for what it is and then let it go. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if maybe there's a really good lesson here. Um, so the Holy Grail shows up. It's covered up. And we see that over and over, right, through these chapters that you can see the Holy Grail-ish because it's like covered with a cloth, but it's it's radiating this glorious light. And we see that again over and over. We see this light motif 
again and again. And that is something that we're going to see in literature over and over and over is light. Many, many, many authors are going to play with light. They're going to play with mentioning light, talking about the absence of light, the presence of light. Um, do you guys so far in the reading, are you agreeing with me that um, the tone of this is somewhat sad or melancholy? When Arthur is being bit, mentioned, yeah. yeah, but like when the other knights are being mentioned, it seems like it's mostly just a little less cheerful than normal. I mean, yeah, I feel, I feel Arthur's like, the only person who seems to really understand the the overall situation. It feels less like a sense of like closing than a feeling of just sort of a continuation, if that makes any sense, because. Mm -hmm. There are just more quests going on and doesn't feel to me particularly different. Okay. I think maybe um, it's I know what's coming. I mean, as as readers who know what is going on, um, and that the world's about to end, yeah, it's kind of sad, but uh world is about to end. So I think that the the tone is I words betray me um when they're going throughout this whole thing and all these things are happening there's an air of almost confusion no one really knows what's happening but they know it's going to be bad yeah. like they know this is going to end bad and they're suddenly like so when's it gonna start turning um but for the moment they're prideful and excited and they're gonna get ready let's go to off go. and find the grail <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but then at the same time with the uh, chapter with Lancelot later on, that whole chapter does seem to be very, uh, very sad. It is also set in the Barren Lands. I can't remember exactly what they call them. Barren the counties where, where the dollar is. And uh, the Waste stroke. or something like that? The Wastelands. Yeah, the Wastelands. The Wastelands, land. yes. Uh, um, I, and I think that lends into that. Also, as um, the person that is just um, generally mildly interested in Sir Kay. I have to obviously remind you that he was <laughs> mentioned as being a steward in this chapter when he hadn't been mentioned as that before. As a steward? I noticed that as well. But the steward is that. like, a steward isn't like a butler, right? A steward is like the keeper. If you watch Lord of the Rings, there's like the steward right. of Gondor, is like the person who's caring for the thing in the place of the king. So- the, You're an the man. Backup king, I guess. Okay, you guys might hear noise in the background, and that's because our yard guys are here and they're blowing onto my patio. It'll end in a second. Um, okay. So in our next chapter, we have the... You can't hear it. Okay, and then I shouldn't say anything. Um, we have the the adventure of Sir Galahad first. And uh, the first order of business is that Galahad has to get a magical sword, I mean, a magical shield to go with his magical sword, of course. And we have... Um, this shield is special because it's marked with the blood of Joseph of Arimathea, who was the man who gave his tomb for Jesus to be buried in. So that's the significance of Joseph of Arimathea. And, and Galahad is a descendant of Joseph of Arimathea, right? And, and we find out later that Galahad is a descendant of him, which means that either Lancelot also is or Elaine is. Presumably so Elaine. One Probably of Elaine. And, and, you know, Mark asked a good question, does the shield have a name? I don't recall. <laughs> did it needs one <laughs> it needs one yes let's something get with, something with let's blood get, in it like let's get a shield name y'all I mean, put a shield name in the comments i hate to say it but it's probably just the shield of joseph of arimathea oh That's no i we need a better boring. name no, we need a better one. Oh yeah better so, than one <laughs> galahad this is this is, to me is an interesting scene galahad meets this young man melius whose dad is also a king a king of somewhere else who wants to be a knight. And they have this Robert Frost, two roads diverged in a wood moment. And Melius takes the way that the pilgrim says has to be won through his own strength and prowess. And then he's criticized by his pridefulness in choosing it. And I found that odd because I felt like, well, wait, isn't it good to not want to take the easy way out? Strudel Kitty? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I was just going to point out, it's definitely, wait, is it? Isn't Elaine the daughter of King Pellis? Or am I just got completely confused? Yeah, he is. Uh, okay. Because that makes sense because he was, they were the one that in their tower, that's where they have the Holy Grail. 
okay. as well that as sense. that spear. So that uh, definitely on Elaine's side. Oh, you know what? You know what I found weird? Um, they were talking at some point about the sword that struck the dolorous stroke, mm -hmm. but it wasn't a sword. It was a spear. Just a spear. And when they were talking about the dolorous stroke being struck with the sword, they were talking about Balin killing his brother, which doesn't make no, any sense because no, that wasn't, wasn't, that. That wasn't that the wasn't. dolorous stroke, but that's what it said, I believe. Now, I'd have to double check that, but it was okay. weird. The dolorous stroke was when he was in the fight. Yeah. That, that was, was a Pelos joke. being injured. Yeah. Um, so this fair damsel, who's Percival's sister, shows up, tells him to hurry and get on the enchanted ship. So this is where we get this enchanted ship, which every time the enchanted ship came up, I just kept thinking of Lord of the Rings on the elven ship that Frodo goes off into the West. And I kept- That's hearing, what I thought of too. <laughs> did you? I kept hearing the music, the Annie Lennox song into the West. I kept like hearing that music as like the theme song in this. Um, it felt and, like so, very, I mean, like we're leaving the world to go somewhere else, like a sort of uh, Lord Alexander. Yes. It's kind of weird. Well, it's kind of interesting because um, Percival's sister shows up and um, tells him to hurry up and get on the enchanted ship so he can go with Sir Bors um, to the castle. Or he tell, tells Galahad that. Get on the ship with Sir Bors and Galahad so that or Galahad, Percival, Sir Bors need to get on the ship to go to the castle where the Grail is. And so, that's a lot. I was just curious. No, we're still with Galahad. Lancelot comes separately on a horse, doesn't he? Lancelot's also on the ship. They're all on the ship. What do you see in general as the role of women in the Grail Quest stories? Not all of Arthurian legend, but just these Grail Quest stories. Carrying stuff? <laughs> they are the <laughs> well, I mean, it's true. Well, there's a woman is a Grail bearer, and I think that's important. Okay, okay, instead of saying they carry stuff, they bear stuff, that sounds a little bit less like manual labor, right? Yeah. Just like, all right, you know, I'm just going to follow around <laughs> on this book, I guess. <laughs> well, what else, though? Well, they're, like, they're like instigators. Like a true woman, I hold stuff. Cause instigators? Instigators. I mean, because it's important to note, especially in the story we're getting to next, not all the women are trying to help. Mm -hmm. And the women who are helping tend to be like just you know bearing around stuff and saying, "Come on the boat, quick!" On the ship. Yeah. Get to the oh, chopper. Something, <laughs> something that's a little unusual, actually. Um, often women will be portrayed badly portrayed in uh, media as um, very passive protagonists or um, characters in general. But these women, while not being very um, interesting, are often the ones who are starting things. Um, they aren't. They aren't passive. Um, they are catalysts or interesting, but they are catalysts for anything that happens. Yeah, oh, that's the women are trying I mean, to seduce the knights, right? I mean, it's <laughs> more. It's more mythologically cohesive to have women be the instigators. If you think about one of the biggest events of Western mythology of all time, all the big names. This was the Emmys of heroes in the Greek mythology, Trojan War, instigating event, woman. Next mm -hmm. three people instigating stuff, woman. Person who starts the war, Paris, although you could definitely argue it was also a woman because it was her that led to this giant series of oaths. Like right. Trojan War starts off with like one dumb blonde dude and five women instigating yeah. things for and then you've got the odyssey which follows stories i mean you you asked about why is it bad that melius chooses this super tough path well i could tell you right now it's because a woman didn't tell him to oh whoa in, nice. our, in yeah. the Grail yeah. knight system it's in arthur's court it seems pretty clear that there's only really two ways to get a quest <laughs> One is if something really crazy happens to drop in your lap, like with all the random white deer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or women showing up with quests or the grail floating through. So the, fact that he was like, so the problem is that he was seeking it for himself. Yeah, and you can challenge knights. And the knights definitely challenge each other all the time for jousting and 
stuff. And that's like a kind of a low grade quest, but like quest quests, those are, those come to you. Okay. You can, you can go put yourself out questing, like looking for stuff to do, but like you don't get to pick what to do. So we get this interesting, um, so Mark's got some interesting comments there. Um, in the next chapter, we get this interesting story of Sir Percival. And I'm going to make the argument later on that I think per Sir Percival is where it's at. Like if you were going to be a knight, he would be the one you'd want to be. Like he's mm -hmm. not the most famous, but he's the one who comes out on top. You know, mm -hmm. um, gets his so kingdom. <clears throat> yeah, this holy woman, recluse, tells him that the powers of evil will lie in wait for him under the Chapmans, and he's promised that if he's worthy, he'll get to marry the woman he's destined to marry, who is Lady Blanchefleur, which is French for white flower. Blanchefleur, white flower. So um, again, with the white, the light, it's this, you know, <laughs> motif. And um, there's, yeah, white cloth. The there's this definite theme of destiny and how you can mess it up. Yeah. And because you're gonna have all these temptations that you need to resist. And I was curious about what you thought the modern application of this was, or if it's still the same thing, which like you, you have this great potential. There are going to be a lot of things that are going to try to get in your way, but you'll achieve your potential if you don't let yourself be tempted by all the stupid stuff. Do you think College? that's the same today? <laughs> I don't know, but let me check Facebook before I answer that. <laughs> What do you think? I don't know if it could be said to be to be uh, analogous to something in particular in modern life, so much as it could be said to be analogous to modern life in general. I mean, okay, like that we're constantly beset with things that distract us from what we should be doing. Maybe, yeah. If you allow yourself to be, because here's the other thing: when you look at the temptations that are popping up. Not many of them are really all that impressive. Really, it's like, mm. ooh, ooh, this is some good wine. I'm like, <laughs> you can set that down for a day. <laughs> <laughs> or like, yeah, there's what women who are about? like throwing themselves at these dudes, but these guys, these the top tier knights seem to have ladies throwing themselves at them anyway. Like, <laughs> well, they're like athletes. Can, they're like modern <laughs> athletes. Yeah. I think we could definitely <laughs> say that, like allowing petty or otherwise acquirable luxuries to distract you will mess you up. It will mess you up. Mm -hmm. Did you guys think in the story with the big black horse from hell, um, did it remind you of the scene in Lord of the Rings with the, like all of the yeah. novels? The you know what it you reminded that, me of? It sounded like, it's, the way you said that, it sounded like a, the, like a TV show or something. The big the black horse from hell. There's a horse <laughs> called uh, Shadow Mirror in a video game. That's his uh, yeah, 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 yeah. shining red eyes. So super useful. Sort of Steve. Yeah, no kidding. Can you pay him at the door? Sorry, the guys came to the door to get paid, and uh, uh, it's on the chair. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Real life intrudes. Um, so the fight between the lion and the serpent is this very thinly veiled Jesus <laughs> Satan battle. I mean, I it's the Chronicles of Narnia. You really can't miss the. Like, do you um, have to hit us over the head with it? Yeah, we get it. You don't have to Does hit us over imagery? the head. Does it even count as imagery if it is so obvious? I don't know. Um, mm. Now, what I thought was interesting was the Percival says he's out searching for Galahad, but he hangs out there for like three days. Mm. Kitty, do you have a thought about that? Uh, I was going to tell uh, Michael that I, I went through and I read like two chapters just like as fast as possible mm. about looking for the Berlin striking the dollar stroke. So Found here's what I found. Uh, that It mentions that um, had lain desolate ever since Berlin struck the dollar stroke in the first year of King Arthur's reign. Um, and then on a different page somewhere he had put um, old King Pelas lay on a rich couch, still tortured by the wound which Balen had gave him so many years before. And then on page 324, 25, it says um, that um, for Gawain has taken away the curse of desolation which Balen brought upon you when he struck the dollar stroke. The dollar stroke um, is when he hits Pelas. Yeah. See, the part I was thinking of was... But you thought it said that it was uh, 
the dollar. They were trying to say afterwards that it, the dollar stroke was when Boleyn killed his brother. Yeah, uh, but I, I, just, I just checked it, and no. Um, so saying, he put out his hand, it. drew the sword easily from the stone, and slid it into the sheath at his side, saying as he did so, Now have I the sword that struck the dollar a stroke. Once it hung at Sir Balan's mm. side, and with it he slew his brother Balan. Is it it said so I think it means. Stone. I think he's. Yeah. Okay. So. What, is it capitalized there? Now have I the sword that struck the dolorous stroke in caps. Yeah, and which it was doesn't a make spear. any sense. Yeah, because it was a spear. Because it was a spear. So what we have now is a uh, editorial error. Author right. fail. <laughs> Also, one more thing that I thought was really weird is King Pelos was healed twice. Yes. The yes. hell was up with that? Like how? It, maybe more people had to feel good about it. It's kind it's, of weird. You got the, the pre-grail where, what is it, Gawain and Lancelot go to the, the Castle Carbonac and they... They like do some prep work with the Grail, and they heal King Pelis and start restoring the wastelands. And then the really big guys come, Percival and Galahad and Sir Bors, and they like fully restore everything. But yeah, they it's weird. Because it like wasn't good enough. Well, in the next chapter, we get to Sir Bors, and we have again a hermit. There's there's this whole idea of that the most holy people withdraw themselves from the world. That is a motif that appears again and again, that if you're really holy, you don't really live in the world. You're just like too holy for the world. So you're just too special. Like, yeah, you're just too special to live in a normal world. As, and we, shall see, about, oh, as we shall see, epitomized by Gala, Galahad later. Yes, yes. Um, right ooh, now, so. Spoiler, right? Well, because he leaves this world, right? Right. Yeah, Strudel Kitty? You could say that um, Percival is then considered more holy because he grew up most of his time away from society. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah? So did Galahad. So did everybody's sister apparently who nobody recognizes. <laughs> so Sir Bors, Sir Bors is told this interesting thing by the hermit. So first of all, he's told to only eat bread and water, which is interesting because one of the seven, seven deadly sins is gluttony says the woman who has five pints of um, uh, Ben and Jerry's in her freezer right now. <laughs> but they have, they're have they only eating bread and water. That comes up again and again. That idea that 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 withholding from yourself of of food and like feasting. But he's- I've worked at a donut shop for the last month. Do you oh, hate the smell mouth. of glaze yet? Yes. Uh -huh. um, I, I um, actually can't smell it anymore. Oh, man. It, just, it doesn't even <laughs> register. Well, he's told, um, oh, yeah, Mark says it's not just water, it's clear water. Yeah, it's this idea of purity. Um, yeah. No dirty water for you. <laughs> yeah, no dirty water for you. Good call, Mark. Good call. So now, we don't know what kind of bread it was. It might have been far more hearty. Like, this wasn't white bread. Yeah, this isn't white bread. There might have been enough in it, it to sustain you. Mm -hmm. It, it's most likely going to be, uh, what, what are they called? Tenchers, I think. Sten yeah, I think they're called tenchers, which were, um, I've, I've, I'm not entirely sure the 100% accuracy of this information. I'm, I've got it all from uh, Shadowversity like three years ago. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure the tenchers were, they were like this uh, flatbread um, that would be kind of dense that medieval people would have whenever they would have a big fe feast, everyone would have a little stack of these little bread pieces. So it's like pita? Uh, we, kind of, yeah, oh, but like, I think it was harder. She's talking about the bread plates. plates. Yeah, and then and it was like, um, they would, okay. um, it would, oh, it would kind ready. of be considered almost like impolite because they would pass them out to the poor later. Oh, um, okay. Well, so he told, Sir Bors is given this interesting um, thing he's told by the by the hermit, and it says he's told that this is a quote for purity of life, and not in pride of deeds. <laughs> well, that makes a man worthy to achieve this quest. So it's purity, not your noble deeds. And I, when I read that, I read that like four or five times because I was thinking that in reality, in real life now, that's what's true. It isn't about like being famous and doing these amazing things. It's about how you live your life and who you are inside. So 
it's like, yeah. Um, so Sir Boris has this horrible choice to make between saving his brother and saving the damsel in distress. He chooses the damsel. Did he make the right choice? Yeah. I almost want to say no. He made the right almost. choice. I mean, is there a right choice in the situation? I feel like I feel here. like personally, I I don't have a brother, but so I would obviously save the damsel because it's like I don't have a choice there. But um, but I mean, I feel like I would uh, prioritize uh, a family member. However, I feel like the whole night night code wise, he chose the damsel in distress over someone he thought could possibly have a better chance of survival, mm -hmm. which is good. However, I feel like the way the way the story is trying to portray it is afterwards when he comes across his brother, his brother seems to be possessed. So I'm wondering if his brother, they were trying to say that that was the temptation he had to go through. Um, like if, um, it, are they trying to say that his brother, the the forces of the universe were using his brother as a conduit for, for one of the temptations he had to go through? Um, okay. The choice because, that he should have gone with them. Because under the laws, I think, it, I think you, you have to examine, like, are we looking, are we considering, is it the right choice by the laws of chivalry? In which case it definitely right. was. Mm -hmm. Or was it the right choice from like a familial love thing? Um, did you guess when his brother got so mad at him about it, did you guess that his brother had been possessed? Cause I totally did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, to me, it goes back to why I think he made the right choice saving the damsel. It's cause look, his brother's a knight. His brother is, like, the only weird thing was he showed up, and it wasn't obvious that his brother had gotten into that trouble trying to save the damsel himself. Like, they're knights, they save damsels. And yeah, so, it's like, you, you're a knight, I was save your own damsel. Be like, oh, oh, thank you, like, I was losing, but you managed to get it done, like, nice job. Yeah. yeah. So... Sir Bors gets hurt because his brother rides over him with a big death <laughs> and I'm ends, sure that would probably do that, yeah. <laughs> he ends up staying in the attic. So many of these stories involve siblings. I mean, I really feel like you could read the Arthurian legend as like a parenting book if you have siblings, like if you have more than one kid. But um, he stays in the Abbey for over a year. Make sure your kids grow up together. Right. Important. <laughs> so make sure they grow up together so they don't have to do. in a joust. Um, yes. And... Uh, and then make sure they know <laughs> what color the other one's armor is. Armor is very important. And then he gets on the enchanted ship. And I felt like it was almost like a game of sorry, where some mm. of the knights get into the same yeah. You know, like <laughs> you the enchanted ship, you're just like home free. So then we go to Lancelot. And Lancelot has actually already caught a glimpse of the grail earlier at mm. Castle Carbonic. So he knows just where to go. Like he don't. They're on a grail quest. He's like, oh, I know where the grail is. I have done seen it before. And he finds this little chapel. And in a weird waking dream, he clap cat, he like sees a dream of um, Nakians carrying a candlestick. That and then, weirded me out. Yeah, it's weird. Until they explained then, that it was an enchantment later. It just felt sort of, I don't know. Yeah, it felt weird. And yeah. this can and then the Holy Grail comes flying in. And there's like all these candles floating in the air. And then I felt like it was a scene from Harry Potter. I just felt like I was seeing all of the illusion, all the, like every story now that's popular, Lord of the Rings, Chronicles of Narnia, Harry Potter, it's all in Arthur. Like it all began in Arthur. And um, Nakian says that Lancelot is held to the earth by his sins. And my question for you is knowing what, Lancelot's sins are, do you think he'd rather be held to the earth by his sins or do you think he'd rather leave it? Mm -hmm. I'm going with the former. <laughs> well, yeah. we know what he chooses. I feel like he'd rather be held to the earth because the earth is where Guinevere is. And mm -hmm. that is... Yeah. Yeah. Well, and again, back to Lord of the Rings where the guy, you know, where she gives up immortality in order, you know, for love. So it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, Mark yeah. says he's seen a lot of Harry Potter. Thanks for having my back, Mark. Um, so there's this moment of great self-truth that I think is so powerful. I think it's actually one of the most powerful moments in the book so to this point so far is that he says that 
he admits that when he only sought worldly things, like when he's fighting other knights or he's out on these quests, then his perfidy didn't make a difference. But it's when he's seeking for holy things that that's when his sin comes between him and what he's seeking. And I yeah. felt like I thought about that for such a long time because I feel like in the world, it's really easy to look around and see people who are making really bad decisions, but it looks like it's working out for them. And I feel like, oh, you need to understand Lancelot. Like you can make bad decisions and it can still work out for you when what you're seeking is involved in the realm of bad things. Hmm. But you're seeking something different. It won't work for you. Well, and he shouts Galahad, not knowing who his son is, of course. Right. Jonathan, mm -hmm. did you want to it's, add something to that? Yeah. So it's not it's not that he's seeking bad things. It's that he's seeking worldly things, which yeah. in this story, worldly tends to be described as bad. But most of mm -hmm. these most of the things Lancelot's done are objectively good. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just, it, he makes he them is, bad by his by his motivation. Mm -hmm. They're still good. I mean, yeah, like, he's saving people. He's beating bad guys. These are good. But things. Why is he doing it? I'm with Jonathan here. Somewhere. He's doing it because it's a quest. I agree. I mean, with he may be doing it for the wrong reason. I do have but, but... A, a proverb that I saw. Uh, it was somewhere they were saying that. Uh, so this 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 rich. I can't remember where the proverb is from, but this rich person he goes to um, a priest or someone who says, "I would like to fund an orphanage." And the priest is like, oh, that's good, that's good, amazing. Uh, and so, you know, they, they organize it together. The orphanage begins to be built. And then the, um, then the, uh, the rich person comes back and says, um, we, we should cancel construction. I realized that the only reason I wanted to build it was because I wanted to see myself as a good person, as a philanthropist. <laughs> Said it weird. And then the, the priest goes, does it matter? Um, what your motivations were to the orphans. Keep going, basically. Um, and that I think that yes, what he the things he was doing was good, but for the value of his soul, they didn't count. Like if it's a point system, those didn't count as good deeds. But the but the good deeds affected the world. Does Still that make, make the sense? World a better place, right? Yeah. yeah, they made the world again a better place, but they didn't make him a better person for oh, doing it. Oh, yeah. yeah that's that's a good way of putting it. The same that's way. Beautiful. Yeah, because, like, I mean, we're about to see later in this story a bunch of people acting out of vaguely noble intentions, but doing objectively bad things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Vaguely, so, noble I like vaguely noble intentions. I like that. Vaguely noble. Vaguely noble intentions. I mean, they're. Yeah, so hmm, they think I mean, they're if talking about a real world example. We could talk about Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's <laughs> not. Yeah, we could talk about Arnold Schwarzenegger all day. Well, I mean, <laughs> talking about somebody who objectively succeeded by almost any worldly measure, but has obvious public moral failings. Yeah, mm. there are so many people who fit that mold. So well, many. I think in one of the most bizarre things that I don't think made any sense to me whatsoever was when Percival's sister Dindrain. Um, she gives her pure blood to save the life of the king's daughter, and she herself <laughs> dies. And all these other women had also died trying to save the king's daughter. And what I don't understand is, I don't think the author really established why it was better for all these other women to die than that one woman. Like, why is it yeah. better for Dindrain and all these other women to die instead of her? Did you feel like the author supported the rationale for that well enough? No. no. Um, I think, I think, I... And just said, I think three times. I think I don't think the author uh, was supporting the castle. All of the characters, at least, seem to be very against the concept of this. And the the castle, they're just like, oh, but it's tradition, it's tradition, and then they have to do it anyway. Um, or mm -hmm. specifically, Dindrain, because the knights they were ready to fight. They were like, like, well, let God be on my side because I'm taking you down. <laughs> um, you'll have to get through me first, and Dindran's like, guys, guys, it's all right. I'll give my blood. I'll do my head. It'll be all right. Um, and then I don't think the author was necessarily supporting this castle's customs. Yeah. Well, the castle was the castle's custom was very obviously 
denounced later as God smote the thing. Yes. More yes. more harshly. There is nothing else in this entire book where somebody gets smitten <laughs> more harshly, more immediately. Like there are people who bad things happen to. These guys, there was no question. This was God being angry and wrath. Boom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So they go back, yeah. they find that like the castle is destroyed, everything's decimated. There are these tombs of all these women who gave their lives. And the, the princess is like, oh wow, through no will of my own, I've brought all this evil upon so many. And I'm like, <laughs> she was unconscious. Okay. I mean, it wasn't her like, fault. Okay. But so the last the last quest chapter we get is Lancelot <laughs> and Gawain showing up to Carbonek. And it's kind of interesting because Sir, um, so Gawain runs into Sir Hector and he tells him, Gawain says, I don't think I'm worthy to see the grail. And Sir Hector says, I keep hearing that from all the knights. They mm -hmm. all say that. And I feel like, um, I feel like it's the earliest documented idea of imposter syndrome on record, right? Like it's like, yeah, <laughs> it's so funny. So he names, he names four knights. Sir Hector names four knights as the best. Galahad, Lancelot, Percival, and Sir Bors. Who's missing? Out of Galahad, Wait. Lancelot, Percival, and Sir Bors, what knight would we have added? Gawain. 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 Sure. Yeah, Gawain. Yeah. So, um, so they end up at this little chapel, and we see the Harry Potter candle come again. And Sir Hector is told... See. Why is there a seven, seven candle seven, candelabra? Because that's seven not a is, Christian thing. That's a Jewish thing. No, seven is a symbol of perfection in 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 all Judeo Christian traditions. So okay. the seven, world seven is just seven, day. seven is just a thing. Well, seven, seven is a thing. It's, a, it's a symbol perfection. of completeness. So seven is a symbol of completeness or wholeness. The, another. The word perfect is translated as perfect in the scriptures also means like whole, complete, or finished. Okay. Um, and so we get the seven you see in like the seven creative periods or days seven that the world created. you get it, um, you get it in the seven, um, like around the walls of Jericho seven times, blow the horn seven times, like that is a seven. The menorah is nine, but it's eight candles plus the, the shamash, the, the lighter okay. candle in the middle. Um, there are lots of different numbers that have different symbology, but seven is going to be, as soon as you see something seven show up, be ready for, for perfection, completeness, mm -hmm. the end to something. Okay. So uh, that was nine for the Norse. So if you're reading something more Norse inspired, it's nine for them. There you go. The nine worlds and then the nine, many other things. The mm -hmm. nine. Well, yeah, we get the nine Nazgul in Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's see. Hey, Mark, I said it. Eight plus the Shamash. And I would like some credit for the Christian girl knowing the name of okay. the lighter candle in the menorah. So there you go. Um, so, I thought it was seven, my bad. <laughs> there you go. Um, we get this really astonishing grail procession led by the grail maiden, who is Percival's intended wife. And it's interesting because Gawain asks what it means, which becomes really important later. <laughs> And um, I think it's interesting that this asking is so important, that, that the asking is so important. There's actually a saying, judge a man by his questions, not his answers. And that's definitely true in here. Um, so uh, I don't know, Strudel Kitty, if you noticed, but Tessa is commenting on your- Yeah, I, I just flipped my hair again dramatically, like, <laughs> so, got it cut um, a couple of days ago. We get- we get this most amazing grail procession. It's super amazing because it's not just the grail. It's also the bleeding spear. Here's the spear. Okay. The silver dish and a candlestick. And Blanche Fleur is holding the grail itself, of course, covered with a cloth. And Galahad going awesome. in and he's holding his sword. I should have brought the sword back again. He's holding his sword by the blade so that it looks like a cross in front of it. I feel like that... That motif, uh, if you can call it a motif, happens a few times. Where yeah. swords upside down. Swords upside down. But think about it. how are you gonna hold a sword like that? Like Jonathan, do you know anything about this? Like when it's no, you can totally do that. You can 
there's it's a it's not there's a, a most problem, common way of doing it, but you can have so you can half sword, which would also involve grabbing your own sword by the blade. So half sorting, half so you normally like hand on both hands on the hilt. Half sorting, you've got one hand on the blade, one hand on the hilt, and you can actually grab the blade with both hands and wield it almost more like a club. Um, you got to remember these guys are wearing gauntlets, which can absolutely grab a sword. Oh, okay, that if makes you, sense. If you if you grip it right, you can grip a sharp sword with bare hands and not slice yourself. You got to remember these things aren't razors; they're more like chisels. Okay. So you, don't, you don't have to worry about casually brushing them. It's the pressure and the slice that cuts. So you can okay. grab a sword by the blade, no problem. Well, it's interesting because he's walking through, and it's like if there is any more. Christ motif of Galahad than right here where he's walking carrying the cross and he's leading the procession of the carrying of the cross I mean, it's it's pretty amazing Galahad alone gets to drink from the grail and He kisses Nakians with literally the kiss of death um, mm -hmm. Which was desired <laughs> and then Galahad who's Pelis's son cures or grandson cures Pelis for real with drops of blood from the bleeding spear, which is weird. <laughs> he gets healed with the blood that's dripping off the spear. But only by the right person. Was, only by the right person. Yeah, only by the right person. Galahad dies, and he's just so obviously the Christ symbol. And then Percival mends this sword. That becomes the story. Percival and Blanchefer become this like rockin' king and queen. And they're <laughs> like the most amazing thing because they even outlast Camelot. Yeah, Strudel Kitty. Oh, I just I just had a thought. The um <laughs> the the dollar stroke. Uh yes, I saw that. Um the um the dollar stroke. It was it was the dollar stroke because it was struck specifically with that spear. Like if Milan had just struck Pellas with his sword, which I think was gone somehow. I'm pretty sure there was something like he had dropped his he sword lost or something the sword. like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, he was um, a guest. He was a guest oh, in Palace right, Castle. Right, yeah. So he didn't so have it. So away. he didn't have a sword. Yeah. But like, if like it was just the dollar stroke because that happened to be the sphere, wasn't it? Because he wasn't. Mm -hmm. he, because it was well, the a dollar stroke, the, or was it? Or was, or was it because that's an Arthur thing? So the dollar stroke, a dollar stroke, is any time a king is stabbed in the thigh, which mm -hmm. is. A symbol of a king being stabbed in the like genitals, um, and in some versions of the story, that's where he is stabbed because it's like a sign that you're because you know they inherited the thing. So if you if you if you make it so the king cannot have more children, you have destroyed the whole like it is treason. So mm -hmm. a dollar stroke is any time a king is stabbed there. So um, so Sir Bors returns to Camelot. He's the one who comes back. Like, I think Sir Bors is like the underrated hero of the story, but- He's the he Samwise Gamgee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two years after the quest begins and many of the seats are empty and we get this ominous foreshadowing in the warning to Lancelot to escape the sins of the world. And it mm -hmm. ends it with these lines. The whole thing ends with these, <laughs> okay, that's funny. <laughs> What'd you learn in Mrs. Van's class? <laughs> uh, <laughs> really interesting stuff. Um, so we, so this is this is the ending lines of the chapters. But in a little while, his eyes, that's Lancelot, traveled back to Queen Guinevere, and he forgot how he had failed when he came so near to achieving the quest of the Holy Grail. So, I race ahead over heels. So, what do you think we can expect in the next? installment of the story death and tragedy death, death and tragedy, tragedy. <laughs> what happens to camelot predictions anyone oh. <laughs> well they don't have much time left to destroy it and they no. seem pretty they seem we pretty can, bent on showing it was going to get destroyed we can hope right we can hope that it's not destroyed even though we kind of know that it is yes no. well Serignus says, says they should have been nicer to the dragons and it would have worked out better. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am Merlina. 
Uh, not Merlin, because Mrs. Van Queen. I love you. Merlina. So we are going to be meeting again two weeks from tonight, mm -hmm. um, July 30th, to do the last, the very last book called The Departing of Arthur. The Departing of Arthur. So, spoiler. Um, Camelot, well, I wonder what happens in that one. I, I, I sure wonder. He goes is on a Arthur still going to be here by the end? <laughs> so what? What I hope that you guys will do, um, perhaps between now and then, if you get a chance, is to watch the musical version of Camelot. If you can mm -hmm. see the musical okay. version of Camelot, Julie Andrews as Guinevere. And the guy who plays the guy, I know that the guy who plays, I want to say Arthur, um, plays Long John Silver in the Muppets Treasure Island. I really like Wait, him. Is it? It's Tim awesome. Curry? Yeah, I, Tim Curry. I think that's his name. No, it's it's Tim Curry from the Muppets. Hundred percent, that's Tim Curry. I didn't know he was in Camelot. I'm pretty well, sure he is. Right. Oh, I, I know. Talk about Magic Dragon. Dragon. That's stuck in my head now. King King Arthur is Richard Harris, so we'll get this. He is. Harry he is King Arthur in Broadway. In the Broadway version. Okay. In the Broadway version. There you go. It's, you it's watch Camelot, that. which is not Arthur. It's a parody. Okay. It's, it's a the Monty Python one. So. But it's really good, and I recommend it. I will next week or mm. next class. I will share in the um, description, and when the video is done, I will share my favorite Arthur movie versions. So. Thank you guys so much for joining in tonight. It was so good to see you, especially Christiana. So nice to see you again. And um, Mark is going to go out on a limb and say some damsel is going to get rescued. So Mark, I, <laughs> pretty safe I don't know. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't bet money on it. <laughs> so fun. So you guys have a great night. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, take care. <laughs> have a good night. Thanks for having class.